since the legislation session went shorter than normal, we are able to present you with the lovely best hair ever, <laughs> Brenda Martin. Commonly known as the Barton Bun. <laughs> yes, I get a lot of comments about it. But I'm just kind of old fashioned too. And my hair's very long, so. See? Before you even get started, yeah. I don't know how everybody looks good, but I'm kind of glad that the state, I'm not believing in local governance, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of glad that the state stepped in to the Plastic. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I already <laughs> think for that. I I think it was necessary to save a lot of things to do, if I can say it that way. Um, I mean, we were talking about, we're talking about choice here, mm. and we're also talking about a large cost to businesses. Sure. And sure. so, in this particular case, on such a benign mm -hmm. issue, I'm really glad that the state did step in. So I just wanted to say that. Well, and again, and another one of those very difficult decisions. Uh, difficult to, I mean, there, there are many sides to that issue. You know, reclamation, uh, pollution, uh, free enterprise, uh, you know, your, your retailers, uh, the individual citizens, and how they're dealing with these bags that are everywhere. Um, options for your retailers to actually uh, go to paper and or go to uh, reusables. Uh, and and here's, here's the other side of it. It was pointed out quite well by others that there's a lot of things that can create litter that people dispose of it improperly. Well, exactly. So once that ban the bag, it's then what's It'll next? be something else. And, Wrappers and... and I appreciate being here and of course it w I wouldn't be able to be here in April uh, if we hadn't already signy died and <laughs> ended the session so um, that part of signy die I'm, I'm happy for but I can tell you um, from January when we started until we signy died it was one of the worst and most chaotic and contentious <sighs> sessions I've had since I have served for five years oh, wow. Wow. Um, a lot of pieces to that puzzle, uh, a lot of players involved in uh, creating that uh, confusion and contention and chaos. Um, uh, kind of sad. I, I don't think uh, it was necessary to uh, have a session that ended, what, 80 days and have a, a record that hasn't been made for 50 years. Uh, it, because somebody wanted to hang a plaque on a wall and they wanted to have something written in history about them. I think that is outrageous. Mm -hmm. We still had a lot of business to do that was left on the table and, and it died. Mm -hmm. And we had worked very hard on much of the uh, uh, policy issues that are important to uh, the folks in Arizona. Uh, not just in my district, but throughout the state. Not only do I represent you, my 200,000 plus <laughs> District 6 mm -hmm. uh, population, but actually the entire state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. So when I cast a vote, I have to think about not only District 6, mm -hmm. but how will this affect the entire state? Because it is a state legislature. And uh, really, uh, sometimes there are people who only think about uh, a couple of of uh, special interest groups uh, within their purview, um, and, and they can make life uh, kind of difficult uh, with um, a lot of uh, posters and uh, marching, and, uh, but they're very noisy, but it's not a noise coming 
throughout the state, mm -hmm. uh, which makes then voting uh, one of those very difficult things because then you're voting against this very noisy, uh, uh, active uh, special interest group. Um, so a lot of pieces to being a, a state representative, uh, but I can tell you that uh, first on my list is, of course, District 6. How, how will these uh, changes or this policy affect District 6? And put that into balance with the state. Does everybody win? And you know, my, my little phrase is government should be on your side, not in your way. <laughs> so regulations, if they're on your side, or are they in your way? <coughs> there's, the, there's a decision that, that has to be made. Uh, some regulations are good because they keep you between the bumpers, you know. Uh, they keep you from going off of a cliff. Uh, but too many regulations clogs the roadway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a balance. And there are some regulations, even uh, at any and all levels, that we need to consider uh, rolling back, altering, amending. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really glad to hear that you're working on the, the charter. Good job. I mean, good go job to go back and to review these things. and. Uh, reaching out to your citizens, your voters within uh, the city of Flagstaff. This will give them an understanding of what a charter is and what does it mean and how it structures how Flagstaff operates. Good job. Really, good job. And uh, with your all's uh, uh, influence in there, in, in those different decisions, uh, it will make Flagstaff city government a better uh, place to have control and regulation and freedom as well because uh, when you change some of these things you'll get some more freedom out of it so, but you can take to heart what I said about voting though you know you're elected to make a tough decision not just to show up but you need to make a decision uh, and if you don't plan on voting then you probably don't need to arrive um, when you, when you get there, like I said, in committees, you can vote present. Um, generally, that is a neutral. It doesn't count for or against uh, whatever uh, proposition or bill that you may be uh, uh, voting on. But um, otherwise, you have to vote. And when you're, when you're working on legislation, you have to vote. Did you have a question? I just wanted to make a comment, but I don't want to interrupt you. There, you, 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 you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were talking about government on your side. I want to tell you, um, the Attorney General's office is wonderful. They helped me about 10 or 12 years ago. And yesterday I was talking to DirecTV on the phone. <laughs> and you mentioned the Attorney General. I did because... <laughs> Well, we signed up in January because the other cable took Fox News off. And they can't, oh, they, they can't like decide whether I watch Fox or not. You're so right. I went to DirecTV and I explained the back here. And then they added the premium channels. I said, I don't want premium channels. And they go, well, we do this with all our new customers and we'll take it off after three months. So my three months was up. I called and I said, be sure you take that off because I don't want to pay for it. So I get my bill yesterday and it's on there. And I called and I was so mad I could spit. <laughs> and um, she was she didn't have any um, authority 46. to do anything until I met the attorney general of Arizona. <laughs> and then all of a sudden she was able to make a credit. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna do that for my Oh my gosh. Yes. So thank you. Tell them yes. all down there. Thank yes. you. I love them. You bet. I, I surely will pass that on. Yes. Fresh never grows. All right. I've heard things like that before. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I I appreciate that. I, I appreciate knowing the effectiveness of the attorney general's office. It it, it makes a difference in uh, how things happen in Arizona because sometimes you need somebody way up that food chain that has some authority and can make um, life changing decisions for. Uh, the folks that are involved in the customer relations, that, so like you, as you said, all of a sudden they had the authority to make the adjustment, which they actually had all along. Yeah. 
But um, so I will uh, mention a couple of things. Uh, of course, everybody uh, is um, unhappy with the budget, and so am I. <laughs> so you know, we're we're on the same page uh, in that area. But I did vote uh, in favor of it, and the reason I did is I was able to negotiate some uh, changes in the budget. So in order to keep those changes, mm -hmm. I had to actually uh, vote in favor of it. So I had to show my support for the amendments and the changes. And the changes were in uh, community colleges. Mm -hmm. Our rural community colleges uh, did not take a, a cut. Uh, and um, we changed the way uh, in Pinal, the community college in Pinal is um, evaluated. They were going to stop funding to the uh, community college in uh, uh, Pinal County because of the population had grown. But Pinal, here's one of those unique situations when you had to you know, put some common sense. Uh, Pinal County has a lot of population, but they don't have industry. And most of their tax base is rural agriculture because that's really what goes on in Pinal County. And yes, there are some shopping centers, there are some of those things, but they don't have a serious industrial base. Most of the people that live in Pinal County commute. They're the bedroom county to Pinal, from Pinal to Pima and from up, up to Maricopa. Um, Many of them work in the mines, they drive to, to Globe. Mm -hmm. So um, all that money is actually leaving, uh, even though you know they have their homes and they do some shopping there, but many of them, as you would know, if you were commuting, you get out of your, your office or your workplace or your construction site, you'll stop close by to pick something up even before you get to the house. Because when you get home, you want to take off your shoes and you want to get off those dirty clothes and, and all that stuff. So we were able to get um, a, a change in the evaluation so that um, uh, Pinal County could maintain their, their revenue from the state. I think that was very good, and as well as the other rural um, uh, community colleges, uh, they weren't uh, damaged. They, they didn't put them in the category of universities. So that was good. So that was the fight that, that uh, your, myself uh, and some of your other rural representatives and the other counties, we uh, really dug in and we, you know, we said, we can't make changes to all these other things because they were not willing to negotiate. But we were able to make negotiations in those areas, and we did. And uh, so in doing so, if you want to keep what you got, you had to vote for it. Mm -hmm. So yes, I did vote for it. And did I like it? No. <coughs> uh, a lot of the um, line items were hard to swallow, I would say. Um, the, uh, the budget was actually uh, given to us by the governor. Mm -hmm. and, and many of you, the governor's uh, budget was available in January, just a little after into January. And uh, so many folks actually started looking at it. But uh, in the past, the House and the Senate each develops their own budget. And uh, this year, we did not develop our own budget. Okay? Uh, we took the governor's budget and kind of pushed it around a little bit, changed some line items here and there, but basically used the governor's mm -hmm. budget, um, which is very disappointing because when we have our budget uh, committee meetings, um, that's when we talk about things that are local in our districts and, and uh, different things that we know need to be funded or things that are being sunsetted so there will be some funds available and where would we like to see the funds that are sunsetting, you know, how, how do we want them to, to be reallocated. Uh, so it was very difficult and this is uh, an extremely austere budget, I mean it's nine billion something dollars. I, that's, I mean, <laughs> austere, okay? But I, I mean that in the sense of the way it is uh, designed, mm -hmm. okay? Cities, towns, and counties. Yeah. Brenda, do you think, and, and, and you know, you may not know, but do you think the reason that the governor did that 
was to try um, to truly resolve the structural debt problem of the state. I I'm not even saying whether that would be a plus or a minus because I, I believe that the legislature should have come up with their own. But do you think that was his intent? Or, or I mean, is it known? I think that's what the public relations hmm. speeches were about. <laughs> Um, he is on a four-year uh, schedule, uh, budgeting schedule, uh, which part of it was shared with us, um, making uh, the most uh, cuts this year and uh, making them less in every year up to the end of his term, which is then a re-election cycle. Uh -huh. So there is some po politics involved in the way the finances um, and, you know, he's a new governor. He's never been in a policy position. This is not like owning a business. It's not like being an entrepreneur. Uh, although there are similar uh, things you need to know, finance, uh, you know, budgeting, uh, those kinds of things, but negotiations between three legislative bodies, mm -hmm. and I say three because you have the House and the Senate and then the governor's office, mm -hmm. but many of our governors, including this one, does not realize or remember or acknowledge that the legislature's prime objective is the budget. It's not the governor's responsibility to prepare, to initiate, or to create a budget for the state of Arizona. Uh, and many of us have talked about that. You know, you're not going to get the governor to stop doing that. But at the same time, um, that's what, that's a big part of our job. And then the governor's job is to implement the policy. Mm -hmm. The governor has the departments of whom receive their funding through supposed to be the legislative budget. So, uh, you know, just like in Congress, if they decide not to fund Homeland Security, they have a reason. They're trying to bring that Homeland Security Department to a point that's under control for certain line items. Because the, the entire department was still funded, there was only portions of it. But that's not what you heard. You heard the whole thing is going to collapse. Well, it wasn't going to collapse. But then again, you had public relations out there, you know, talking in that way. And most folks were too busy, you know, taking care of the kids and going to, you know, school and uh, vacuuming, and dusting, and taking care of the car and just living our lives that there's so much out there it's hard to uh, to know the difference Brenda mm -hmm. yes just a quick comment because I've worked for you know business for 34 and a half years mm -hmm. and I was never an executive per se right. but I know that the budgeting process started some you know the, the, the head of the company would put out a figure and say I want mm -hmm. you to stay within this but it was up to the departments mm -hmm. to come up with the ways mm -hmm. to be able to implement that that, that went back up. So that, that's why I'm a little confused mm -hmm. about Doug's approach because he was a businessman and you would think that's the way he would look at it. But no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you think our governor has gone against our laws then? Against the laws? All himself? Or his... I'm not going to say he has broken the law. No, mm -hmm. because there is no statute that makes that... Um, that uh, he would say he was providing his options. But I have a pen and a phone. Okay, here's my options. Okay, I received his very first veto. Oh, that was me. It was it was the uh, uh, the animal livestock bill. Oh yeah. That uh, because. Uh, misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a bill that uh, provided increased protection and uh, for, for their domestic animals. It actually uh, provided uh, 
a way for judges to uh, issue uh, a request for a, a, some uh, evaluations when people come in from uh, the hoarding and the extreme cruelties. Uh, it gave some more tools to the judges to uh, have them evaluated and to look at those things. It allowed um, your sheriff's departments and, and police officers to um, have a statute that really talked about and defined hoarding. What is that? You know, what is it not? I mean, just because you have uh, uh, eight or ten cats, you know, they might be good mousers. You know, I get it. I get it. But that's not really a hoarding situation. A hoarding is when the animals are, uh, they're, well, they're harmed and they're sick, they're not being fed well. Uh, maybe they're, they have a disease. To, uh, you know, that's, that is when having too many animals for not really the right reasons. Um, then somebody can go in and make an uh, assessment. Maybe they just need a little help with some of the, the uh, uh, animal folks out there. To, to bring them up to speed. Maybe they just need a little of this or a little of that. That was in there to help uh, the, on the domestic side. 90% of our animal cruelty, dogs and cats. The other 10% are other types of animals. Uh, and mainly it would be uh, the domestic horses that are non-livestock uh, horses. Um, what the bill would do is establish the fact that uh, there are certain uh, uh, felony charges can be filed for these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, certain types of increased misdemeanors. Uh, I mean, we, we had, th there are so many problems with the, the domestic animals, whether it's uh, the horses that are on the, you know, like the five acre or less kind of thing, and you have your kids out there riding them on weekends, or maybe you're doing horse shows and that kind of thing. But um, we wanted to separate the active livestock operations that are commercial. And uh, they're under the USDA, they're under the FDA. You know, they have a lot of other criteria. Plus, these ranches are very valuable. And so is their livestock, very valuable. Uh, we don't have one, not one case in the state of Arizona of livestock cruelty. Mm. There's no convictions at all, ever. I tell you, with the amount of people that I have uh, being an ag water and land chairman, uh, I go to a lot of folks' ranches and uh, have a lot of different meetings with them. They love those animals. I mean, they know that they're going to be steaks someday. They know that. But they just love what they do. And they're not they are not harming the animals. Uh, if they harm an animal, they're going to lose $1,300 if something <laughs> happens to that cat. Now, why would you do this? This is not even logical. And it's just not happening in Arizona. I can't speak for any other state because I don't deal with any other state. Yes? Did the governor indicate why he vetoed it? Uh, yes, he got a lot of calls from the National Humane Society, uh, uh, PETA, and uh, and uh, uh, Sheriff Joe. You mean those groups that uh, probably kill more animals than any other? In any other in the nation? That is true, and uh, their massive email blasts were all fictitious. Uh, but uh, we had people calling my office uh, all the time that my assistant was there from. Everybody but Arizona. Of course. You know, Oregon, you know, oh, Idaho, yeah. Idaho <laughs> e I mean, everywhere. Um, and uh, trying to, to kill the legislation. And the, the National uh, Humane Society uh, has said more than once that their main goal is to kill the agriculture industry. No livestock or poultry. Um, that is their goal, ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes to get there is what they will do. Now, you know what? We don't really know that kind of stuff yeah. until, you know, and then they say, well, you don't love animals. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah. And I don't want them harmed. Uh -huh. And you know what? I think people have, a, have animals and dogs and cats and birds and all that. 
they should take care of them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, otherwise, you know what? They need to live somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the same as a livestock operation. Yeah. That is their income. That is their livelihood. Mm -hmm. They really, really, between the veterinary care and the type of feed, they, they go to millions of dollars to get specialized feed mm -hmm. for different kinds of uh, cattle. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just incredible. And when you have these uh, National Humane Society folks who want to put an end to uh, livestock industry and the poultry industry, uh, actually, poultry, they're the ones who put a citizen initiative, better look out for that on our ballot, by the way, in California. This an experience in both the private and public sectors, and has been a longtime advocate for Arizona causes. Brenda has two granddaughters, six grandchildren. Thank you. And I have a great granddaughter on the way. Her name is already selected Zoe Joyce Mueller. Beautiful. Well, she will not be first alphabet. No. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to tell you that uh, this week uh, I got the news that uh, Governor uh, Jan Brewer has endorsed my candidacy. Yeah. 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 She uh, has also been very involved with Republican women through many, many years. And uh, so that was uh, a real pleasure to uh, receive that information. And. Uh, the NRA magazine, I saw the, the uh, insert in this month's uh, uh, magazine. It shows that I am an A-plus supported NRA uh, supporter. All good, all good stuff. There, there's been, I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of the uh, flyers that have been uh, floating around in our district these days. Uh, one of them, uh, I'll start with the uh, the one that is the most private and uh, most controversial, I believe, and that is that um, they're using uh, my position on uh, abortion and uh, termination of pregnancy in a very limited way, because actually I am pro-life. And I'm pro-life, and I'm very proud to be pro-life. But in Arizona, and in our nation, it is true that Roe v. Wade is still the law. Now, in Arizona, it is still, of course, the law. But we did change some of the requirements and regulations in that we now limit that termination to 20 weeks or less. We have uh, good scientific information that proves that the child can feel pain after the 20th week. So uh, let us have mercy. Okay. Um, but let, let me be clear, I understand that it's the law. The flyer went out that said that uh, my stance was that only in the event of the likelihood of the death of the mother was I involved in uh, supporting such a thing. Not true, because also we understand that rape and incest are additional societal situations that happen, and I, I am saddened that those things happen. But we understand that, and we know that sometimes a termination is necessary. So, um, just know that my liberal progressive uh, opponents are supported by Planned Parenthood, and they will try to reinstate uh, under taxpayer funds late-term abortion, and they have made a statement. So just know that um, the way they put their flyers together is uh, a bit of a, a little bit of truth and a whole lot of. Uh, uh, untrue. untrue. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So then quickly I'll go through the other uh, the hit piece that's running around. 
And uh, it says that I want to turn uh, Arizona into a nuclear waste dump. <laughs> that, that was a good one. And um, I think you can see that these are really distractions from the real issues, the real issues at hand. Balanced budgets, health care decisions, education reform, jobs, and business, it, without which nothing else matters. We don't have jobs and business, we don't have an economy. We don't have a tax base. We cannot support other programs that we're interested in supporting. And the, um, the memorandum that the legislature signed and sent to Congress and the Department of Energy really is how state legislat legislatures uh, communicate with Congress when they are thinking about programs for the states. So the, the memo actually said, if at some point in time you are interested in making this particular recycling center, we are interested in maintaining ourselves on the list. That's all it said. It didn't say we were dumping anything. And remember, this is a recycling center where 96% uh, of the uh, supplies will be recycled and made into a new product to be reused, thereby reducing the amount of uranium that we must mine or import. So we will be reusing the same fuel supply. And remember, we also have uh, medical, uh, nuclear medicine and a variety of, of low, um, what do they call it, low, low level nuclear materials um, to be recycled. The um, community would, uh, of course, have to uh, understand and be involved from the beginning to the end uh, your city councils, your community committees would all be involved and ultimately make the decision on whether you were interested. There's actually only mm, five uh, areas within the state of Arizona that could even possibly have the correct geology to even be considered. Uh, part of that geology is it has to be uh, more than 2,000 feet below the surface it is within a salt uh, strata. There's only a few areas in, in Arizona that, that meet even the basic uh, criteria. But then again, remember, we are trying to promote our STEM classes, our science, mathematics, our technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, you know, these students need a place to work after they get out of the university. Uh, where exactly uh, are they going to work? We have to look ahead. This is well beyond 10 years from now, even in consideration. So it gives time for some of these students to go through uh, uh, university, uh, get some uh, doctorates and uh, master's degrees uh, in this specialized uh, skill. The jobs pay in the average of $80,000. They bring $225 million to the community. That's new money and a new product to export from your community, either within the United States of America or to be exported to other countries who are in need of the recycled fuel. So uh, we need to uh, just remember that these uh, little, what we call hit pieces, are not actually all the truth they're just trying to smear and confuse the issue and take your minds and the others off of the real issues of, uh, that we have in the state of Arizona. We need to maintain our jobs. I can tell you that uh, Chester Crandall was, he was also here today with his lovely wife. Uh, and we really are the jobs team. We really did make the difference. And, uh, so I thank you for your support. I know, you know, talking to the choir is uh, uh, what some people say this, this happening here, but we do need to remember if we're on the same page of music and are we singing the same melody? And uh, so it's always good to get together uh, and give you some information that you can use when your neighbors ask you about these flyers. 
it's important that you will have, have something to say about it and let them know that it's a distraction. And uh, these, these are actually being paid for out of uh, Washington, D.C. The uh, unions, uh, we call them the Obama unions, <laughs> uh, ACIU, is uh, uh, funding most of the uh, program, as well as, uh, let's see, I wrote down the name of it. The Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, which is being supported by the SEIU, as well as the uh, AFSC Committee, which is the Associated Federal, State, County, Municipal Employee Union. So uh, that's the big national. You remember what was going on back east, uh, uh, Wisconsin, I think. Uh, they were really tearing it up down there. And they did tear up the Capitol building over there, the marble floors and the columns. This is the same group. And they have targeted this district, one of four districts in Arizona, that they believe that they can bomb with these bad uh, hit pieces and get people to change their mind and think of the uh, truth. So we need to do diligence and uh, keep the faith. And I thank you for your support and uh, look forward to the victory on November 6th. A bit more about when you were in the East. How long did you live back there? I was, I was born in Cleveland. Oh, of course. And then in the hospital in Cleveland. Where my mother uh, was. I don't want to tell my stepfather. So my mother found out that my mother had had a baby in a bandage attack in Ohio. And so from New Hampshire back to Ohio. And there. I see. Right, right. Anyway, it's about 17 years in New Hampshire. Okay. And then 22 years in Speak. Okay. Go. And hello, Flagstaff. It is so fabulous to be here. I am your current representative, Brenda Barton. I represent uh, Legislative District 6. And I am, because of the particular date and time, running again for election, which will happen in 2014 in November. To encourage you to support me, I want you to know that I am the Agriculture and Water Committee Chairman. Very, very important to Arizona. Uh, water is liquid gold in Arizona. And as uh, we move forward, you should know that agriculture in Arizona is a multi-billion dollar business. And we want to keep it that way. And, uh, and grow that particular business as much as possible. Uh, another thing that we need to be uh, concerned about is our watershed and how we take care of our forest, uh, increasing our water through proper forestry management. So we have to uh, work with the federal government as well as uh, taking care of our state land and get the uh, private property owners involved in many of the management programs that are available. Okay. Oh, representative of what? I'm serious. 
I have had that, uh, trying to call different departments and divisions, and uh, sad, sad place to be for uh, this great uh, country, United States of America. And uh, as it's been said, to be leaving this kind of legacy for our children, our grandchildren. I have a great grandmother. Hi. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> that I am leaving for my great-granddaughter. And if we can't get the bull by the horns in this thing, turn it around, I don't know what kind of a life we're leaving for those great grandbabies. And uh, it, if it stays the way I see it, you're not going to like it. Of course, most of us might not be here. So we'll say, well, that's all right. We don't have to worry about it. Let those kids handle it. You know, it's up to them to make it. If they want to change it, let them change it. I heard, I heard, I heard people say that. I said, wait a minute. This is an inheritance of freedom and liberty that was given to us. And it is our obligation as American citizens to pass it on. It really is our obligation. We need to stand up and be citizens. Being a citizen means showing up. You can only change things if you show up. Emails are important. Pass them around. Let people know about things. That's okay. But you better show up at the meeting that you're talking about in your email. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yep. I mean, you want people to show up, you're inviting them and come along and let's get her done. And then they don't show up. What was more important than saving your country? It really is, at that point, saving your country. If you don't read enough emails, I'll send you some on over. <laughs> and you'll find out we are very close to losing Land of the free and home of the brave. We're here. We're free. We can come and go as we please. So we think. You really cannot come and go as you please. And you better find out where the government has drawn the line. Because the government has drawn the line. Okay, we're supposed to be the government. And whatever happened to... Uh, the consent of the governed! Oh. Is that us? That's yes. supposed to be. That's us. And you know what I say? I withdraw my consent! <laughs> you cannot do that, whatever that happens to be, anymore. I disagree. I'm an American, and I disagree. You better let somebody know that you disagree, though. Don't just pass it around in an email. You still have to show up. You have to show up to vote. You have to show up at meetings so that more than three people show up. In the meetings where three people showed up because somebody else was, well, there was a program on TV. I just had to record. <laughs> That's not being a citizen. It doesn't really mean that every hour you're awake, you have to show up at some meeting. But you better show up at the meetings that really count. You know, and home of the free? Don't you think we need to make sure we're still home of the free? Yeah. In 18 months from now? Yeah. yeah. Come on, there's a lot of things going on out there. We can share that information. And you know what, I do not have a tinfoil hat. I do not have a tinfoil hat. We can get a one. And I do not ride in black helicopters. <laughs> but there are those that do. And they're looking at you. <laughs> Okay. Y'all right. know that it's important. But let us convince somebody else. 
if everyone would convince one more, we would be doubled. That would double our strength. One more convinces one more. In our neighborhoods, in our communities, at our job sites when you're allowed to discuss these things. Seriously, our state is in a situation much like our country. Because we have people who claim to be conservatives, want to maintain freedom, want to maintain those issues that we care about. But when it comes time to stand up, back us up, they're not there. They're not there. They say, well, you know, the voters in my district, they don't particularly like that topic. And we don't talk about those things in my district. I'm, this is, I'm telling you, the truth. We don't talk about those things in my family. Well, I thought it was a, an issue for the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. Is it not an issue for this country of ours that we love so dearly? How can it be something we can't talk about? Mm -hmm. America, we talk about everything. <laughs> well, we most of it we talk it to death and we talk about five things and that's all. Turn the page. Let's talk about five more things. Anyway, I love you all, and I want to do the right thing for you. You know I do. And I appreciate your support financially. I have some uh, sheets over there you can take it with you. Uh, mail them in. Uh, you can first go online at barton4az.com. There's a place that you can uh, uh, online uh, debit card or credit card. And I uh, appreciate that very much, you know. We're getting these signs ordered, and we can put these signs out, and run our ads and that sort of thing. I uh, appreciate all the support from each and every one of you. And uh, long as you wait. Yeah. Right? <laughs> process and uh, subcommittee process, uh, who to talk to, who you don't need to talk to because there's some of those too. Um, but uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am, uh, well first of all, do you know where Lease Ferry is? Yeah. Well, yes. that was my family that established Lease Ferry Crossing back in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. uh, I am fifth generation and I believe it's safe to say that I am Arizona. I love this state. I love everything about it, from the forest to the desert. I have family in Yuma. I have family in Flagstaff, family in Mesa and Chandler, and in uh, Safford, Arizona. It's a fabulous state. It's a big state. It's one of the big western states. And we have resources that we need to put into action to get ourselves out of this economic uh, doldrums that we're in. But back in the 50s, President Eisenhower had a little recession of his own. And because of that, my family left Arizona and went to California. Because at that time, that's where the jobs were. California was growing and building. Uh, we didn't have EPA. We didn't have uh, NEPA requirements. And uh, there were jobs to be had in Arizona. 
I was there for a few years and uh, couldn't wait to come back to Arizona, and uh, I am so glad to be here. I want to create in Arizona that environment that people come to Arizona for the jobs. Okay? This is the destination for prosperity. This is the destination where if you want to go into business, we're going to clear the decks for you. And we did put together quite a few pieces of legislation this uh, session through the uh, Arizona Commerce Commission, giving special uh, tax breaks to people who uh, bring their businesses to rural Arizona, which uh, all of the rural caucus fought pretty hard to get. And uh, the rural caucus is quite strong, uh, which is everything outside of Maricopa and Beaver County. <laughs> So I'll be glad to have another help date there. It'll be very nice. Um, I'm also uh, a graduate of the uh, Doty London uh, Excellence in Public Service Series 2009. I worked for municipal government for 21 years. I was uh, in the accounting department and materials management. So there's some budgeting background. I understand how these budgets uh, can be pushed around how they can hide things in a budget, and uh, how financial reports are, are important. Um, one of the, uh, well, wait a minute, I'm, first of all, I'm going to finish telling you a little bit about me, and then I'll tell you what I did in the legislature. Uh, I'm a past president of uh, the Republican Women's Club in my county, uh, Grant County, where I lived before. Now I'm a resident of Payson in northern Hema County. And uh, I was also a region director for the Republican Women's Club in the southeastern Arizona. Worked on a lot of campaigns and uh, got a lot of people elected, a lot of good Republicans. Uh, got a lot of those petitions uh, signed and got a lot of $5 donations and got a lot of, a lot of uh, $20 and $100 donations as well for the traditional candidates. And uh, I'll let you know that I am also uh, AAA rated with NRA. They like me very much. <laughs> And the uh, Arizona CDL, uh, I am endorsed by them as also. And uh, uh, on the Pachyderm rating, I am currently number eight in the House of Representatives, a Reagan Republican. So I, I, that's some pretty good stuff. So this year in the legislature, we have really done quite a bit to stabilize the budget for Arizona. Um, we have a $150 million debt buy-down that we put in our budget, $450 million into the rainy day fund, looking forward to that one cent sales tax that we plan on allowing it to expire. So when you were talking about that, uh, I want to, want to uh, let you know that we have no intention, uh, through the legislature that is, to bring it back. Uh, of course, that was something that the governor wanted and uh, she worked it throughout the counties and through the, the uh, county supervisors and the school districts. We also have uh, $21 million for university students for retention and course corrections. We have a tuition equalization between the three universities that the state will have the same amount of tuition subsidies going to students for all three universities. There was a, a little bit of uh, disparity between the different universities. So now the state will have the same amount of uh, funding for the tuition for each student regardless of the university that they attend. We also put in uh, $6 million into the University of Arizona Medical School and $40 million for K-3 reading program. We have a law in Arizona that says you cannot be promoted from the third grade unless you can read and pass the test. So it's not just can you read in the classroom, but you have to pass the reading exams. All of the schools will have the same reading exam. Parents cannot come in and say they want to allow the student to be promoted. We took that option out because we had some parents that didn't want their children held back. They need to read. They need to know how to read to be promoted to the next level. If they can't read, 
They can't do you know, their own classes. You know, whether it's mathematics or geography or science, they have to have the reading comprehension uh, to understand what it is they're reading so that they, they can learn and become better students because we are in competition with China, with France, with South America, and, and we need to uh, put ourselves up and get our students up there where they belong. <laughs> I want to let you know that, of course, campaigns and getting our message out is not free. And today, I can accept cash, check, and or credit cards. <laughs> and uh, the uh, individual personal amount is $424 each uh, per person is the maximum. Of course, 10 bucks goes a long way these days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it can cover the gas as well. Uh, and on my website, which is barton 4 az I have a link there that you can actually uh, provide a contribution online. And of course, I would appreciate it if you did that. We have to buy signs and radio time. And uh, I know that uh, you, you're aware that uh, Bob and Chester are running under the Clean Elections Program, which I like the Clean Elections Program. I'm glad it's there. So you need to make sure you all give your $5 to those two candidates. It's really important. And sign our petitions because if we don't get enough signatures on our petitions nothing else matters because our name won't be on the ballot it is critical and actually they have to be turned in the 30th of May we're looking at two weeks and this is turn and burn so if you have uh, petitions right now with two or three names on them please that could make a difference there have been candidates who didn't get on the ballot for one signature we cannot let that happen. The Democrats have targeted District 6, and they're going to try to put everything they can into making sure that the Republicans are not elected in District 6. Following the redistricting and all, uh, all that fun stuff. And uh, it's important that you know that, that they're coming after this district. This district goes from the Grand Canyon Flagstaff, of course, Verde Valley, and then into Payson, from Payson all the way over to Denver. And uh, it's a big district, and part of the district is still my old district, uh, part of the Navajo County and Northern uh, Kilo County. But um, I'm asking for your vote, and uh, all three of us, uh, of course, need your vote and your financial support. And if you don't remember anything else, remember my three R's. Reform it, repeal it, or replace it. I want to address a couple of things that I heard from your questions. I wrote down a few uh, items here. We had some legislation regarding the border, and uh, they were un unsuccessful. Some of them actually went to the governor who vetoed them. Uh, she has done that before. Uh, it's not an election year for her, and there was no 1070 that she could ride on this time. And it's very unfortunate that she decided to veto some of the, uh, the bills that went to her. Uh, some of the, uh, well, the 17th Amendment, so you mentioned that. I uh, support repealing the current 17th Amendment and returning it to the states. If we had <coughs> legislatures controlling who goes to the Senate, they would be looking out for our interests. There's a lot of laws that would have never passed because the Senate is looking out for the states. They're looking out for their economy, for the border. Everything that goes through the House of Representatives has to be approved in the Senate, just like it is in Arizona. So it's important that as we move forward, we need to let more and more people know about the 17th Amendment and work towards getting that repealed. So I, I am definitely in favor of that. You mentioned also Agenda 21. Uh, Agenda 21 was signed in 1992 by then President George Bush. It was not ratified by the Senate. Once the Senate received cards and letters and love bouquets from the people of America, and they saw some of the maps 
that showed habitat zones, they decided it wasn't something they wanted to vote for. So that was a good thing. So sometimes we think it, we don't make a difference. But united, we can make a difference. And it's important that we let them know that we don't want Agenda 21 ratified, and we want to stop them from putting it into action through policy. That's exactly what they're doing right now. In 1993, President Clinton signed an executive order. And the executive order told his cabinet departments, such as the Department of Administration, Energy, Interior, Housing and Urban Development, that they were to begin implementing the precepts of the Agenda 21. It also affects our border. Agenda 21 also affects the border. And uh, there's a, I, I know that you all know that there's a lot of information about it. You can go to their very own documents. You don't have to go to anybody else's documents that may be tainted by somebody's personal view. Their own documents will tell the story. The uh, SB 10 or SB 1507 was the uh, the bill that came out of the Senate that was the Agenda 21 bill that uh, we tried to pass. It didn't get passed because the solar industry told about it was about five to ten. A few of those would have could have been convinced, but there were some of them that could not be convinced to support it. The solar industry said. If you vote in favor of this and pass this out of the House and the Senate and send it to the governor, we will dump millions of dollars against you in your reelection. We will not support you, and we will make sure you do not get reelected. That's the real part. Believe me, we try. We try. We we use the, the documents from uh, all of the uh, protocols of Agenda 21, we showed them how it was being used through the ICLE in the local governments. I explained to them that right now in Apache County, which is my current, still my current district, the District 5, they are fighting the ICLE in their cities and towns. Housing and Urban Development has come in with an $800,000 grant. It's a lot of money to Apache County. Apache County is a small county. Half of Apache County is on the reservation. The lower half of Apache County is only a few small towns. $800,000 is a lot of money. And they wanted to come in and establish local planning and zoning designed through the Judge 21, through the real court. The people there found out about it, and they've been fighting them for the past eight or nine months. They wouldn't even, or the cities and towns wouldn't even give them information about the grant to begin with. They wouldn't tell them who was involved, who had filed the paperwork for the grant. They had to actually use a FOIA to get the information. It took months. They went to every city council meeting. They went and they were always on the agenda to talk. So they are making a difference. And uh, some of the folks that were bringing the uh, $800,000 grant in there are getting more worthy. And that's what we want. We want them to give up and go away. We don't want the federal government telling us how to plan and zone our own cities and towns, how to use our own water, our own open space, our forest, what can be multi uh, how multiple housing apartments, density, there we go, and what has to be open space. This is not for Washington, D.C. to tell us. As a sovereign state, we decide. We decide where we want to live and how we want to live. It's not up to them. But until and unless we draw a line in the sand, they will kick the sand in our face. So I'm asking you, I, I know that you know you guys are active and you need to do, I, I think Flagstaff actually pulled out of it. They were kind of involved in it, 
and I received some information that Flagstaff was considering withdrawing from the ICWI. And we can verify that, so if anybody here um, can do that, I would love to have the real information on that. Um, Okay. <laughs> they call it something else yes. because they have different names for the same thing. Uh, you know, growing smarter is is one of those. Growing smarter, right? Sustainability. Yes, all, all of those. Exactly. And that's right. Absolutely. I want to tell you also, uh, and you may know this, that Tombstone is in a fight for its life for water. Yes. And I, I don't know whether you know whether uh, Goldwater's Nick Dranius has actually uh, stepped up and they are taking this case. Um, one of the things that uh, is very interesting is that uh, Nick Dranius and I have been talking about the uh, water rights in Arizona and also the western states because we are unique in our statehood, unfortunately. We didn't have the equal footing of the other states. And it goes back to the Enabling Act that enabled us to become a state and how it was drawn up and what was agreed to. Nick Dranius and I have been talking about how the Agenda 21 has been implemented through policies in the Forest Service and the Department of Interior with the road closures and how ro the roads are being closed even though they're county roads. They don't have authority to close a county road. They just go put a gate up and hope nobody fights them. That's really true. Again, in Apache County, I just love these folks. They are fighting the Forest Service Department of Interior on road closures. On all the roads that they can prove, they have to prove that they were county roads. There's a criteria and they are fighting the uh, Department of Interior on the road closures. Uh, we've had people who have gone in through a county road while they were back in the forest. As they were leaving, the gate was locked. The gate was open when they went in. And when they came out, the gate was closed. Luckily, it was somebody that was local and kind of knew the lay of the land, knew where the closest residence was, and was able to walk to the residence, make a phone call, Call the Forest Service, and they had to come out and unlock the gate. That's one of the roads that they're fighting about, because it's a county road. If that had been a road, you know, if somebody had been up there enjoying the forest from Tucson or uh, Yuma on a vacation, they, they had no idea. And uh, it was, uh, I think it was uh, in November. So it wasn't totally snowy winter type weather, but he gets, gets down into the 40s overnight, into the 30s sometimes. Um, it could have been very bad. So there are people out there, just so you know, that there are, you know, there are some folks out there that are trying to do their part. And that's what it, we all have to do our part. And uh, we're going to do our part in the legislature. And, you know, with your help and your guidance and you let us know what you're interested in, and, and that's what we'll do, because we represent you. It's a constitutional republic. Uh, we use democratic principles, but we are not a democracy. We are not mob rule. We represent you, and we want to represent you well. One other quick thing before I stop talking <laughs> is um, uh, about the renewable energy standards tariff. You know, they stop with uh, the RES, but it's R-E-S-T. It's a Renewable Energy Standard Tariff. So it's a tariff on all of our utility company, co consumers. And I don't know if you have APS up here. Yes. Uh, okay, so you have the tariff. And uh, the tariff, of course, is for the sustainability of wind and solar. The uh, Corporation Commission folks that are running right now are very interested in rolling it back. They can't actually stop it because there are some contracts that have been let and the Constitution, which we've sworn to uphold, says that the legislature cannot stop a contract 
when it's still being performed appropriately under the law in which it was created. But what we can do, and what we're looking to do, is to not allow future contracts and not allow increases to the, res of the uh, renewable energy standard tariff. So that as these companies, uh, SRP, APS, et cetera, and there are many others, uh, Solar One, uh, as they receive the uh, subsidy for their product, the subsidy will begin to be smaller and smaller. We have um, Paul Newman on the commission right now, who is a Democrat, uh, he's an Obama Democrat, and he wants these, the tariff to go to 40%. And uh, he's up for re-election. We can make sure that that doesn't happen. So thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. And uh, I know that you are all workers and, and uh, love and appreciate your country and your state of Arizona. And uh, we want to uh, represent you well. Thank you. So great for the special exam to pass the reading. Do you know that a Papa suggested a um, homosexual education in school? I just received town hall letter from you. So please, if you don't know, pay attention. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that you know that. And uh, we, we are watching. We are watching. We're watching the school boards because remember, the school boards have the autonomy. In Arizona, the school board uh, is really king in education. I mean, we have a department of education, we have that sort of thing, but the school board decides a lot of the curriculum and the textbooks. So, the school board is so important. And you all need to be on the school board. <laughs> you know, so you can watch those things and, and you can see what they're doing and uh, be aware of how the money is being spent. There's a lot of money in education. I'm serious. There, there are millions and millions and millions of dollars in education. But it's being <coughs> kind of hidden. It's not going to the classroom. The uh, <coughs> Auditor General audited the school districts. There's uh, $2.8 billion in the bank of over-assessments for special bonds. They took too much money. But they haven't given it back. So you need to find out what your school board's doing and where their money is. One other thing you might be able to use to get that information was uh, one of the bills that I worked on and passed in, my, in the first session. Uh, anybody with a county background would understand the term CAFER. It's a Consolidated Annual Financial Report. And that's what is used for most of the cities and towns, counties, and state for their bonding. Every piece, every little dime of revenue and expense is in there. Wages, special bonding, everything. If you want to know something about a municipality or a county, that's the document that you want to go to. The bill that I worked on and was signed by the governor actually requires all cities and towns, counties, and the state already did the, the consolidated and financial report. It must be posted on their website. It must be posted in a prominent place so it's easy to find. It must be printable. Most of them are uh, PDF. You could go in and print one or two pages of, of your interest. They're generally 100 pages or more. Because, well, it, it, does, it depends on the, nice that you know that. Uh, it depends on the entity uh, that's preparing the report. Because some, some of the very small towns, they're, they're 250 pages. Um, state, of course, is thousands of pages. But it's indexed. And you can go in and find the category that you're interested in. And you can print out a few pages, take it to the city council meeting, and ask them about it. It's called a paper on all of it? Yes, it's a consolidated annual financial report. I did bring, um, I have in my bag, 
I did bring the actual bill itself in a couple of pages. It's, it's a very short bill. You don't, you don't need 50. Uh, let, let me get it for you right here. But that would have been in the first session of the 50th legislature. Uh, there are the main the main part is right here. Like I, I have about 10 copies. I'll leave them here with you. This it tells you uh, what the cities and towns are supposed to do and how they're supposed to post it. Um, this is actually the bill. Uh, you know, it's just two pages, but that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble through the League of Cities and Towns. Uh, they, they weren't uh, real interested in requiring that, but finally we got them to understand that most cities and towns and many counties were already doing the Consolidated Annual Financial Report, but they weren't posting it and they weren't making it available. The city that I work for, they do a, the CAFER as well. I asked one day the city manager if I could have a copy to read through. Now I'm in the accounting department. He didn't know where it was. Mm -hmm. Finally, he said, oh, it's still with the accountants. They're, they're still printing it out. Well, he didn't even have one that was three or four years old. He couldn't find it. So it's just a, a small thing, but it can be very useful. It was very useful for some folks in Pinal County. Uh, they were trying to raise the taxes. They said they were out of money. And uh, the bank account looked like they were broke. But when you went to the CAFER report, it shows they had taken the money and it was all invested. There was a lot of money. They didn't get the tax increase. That was pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, they, they were happy to have this tool that because they represent you too. Constitutional Republic, they also represent you. You're the taxpayers. And this is a keep them honest kind of bill. Yes. I have a question that it's not really a hot topic probably with ministry in uh, Arizona, but, but it has to do with our state government. And I'd like to ask you, That's right, I'm swallowing. Mm -hmm. This is kind of complicated. So. Okay. <laughs> anyway, if you're a business owner, anybody in here that's a business owner can probably relate to this. But I'm, I'm a business owner here. So I have a state contract in Arizona for a particular product. And as you know, you go to bid on that. And you usually put a bid against you know, 15 or 20 different businesses. And your profit margin is very narrow. So how is it that within the last couple of years, the Department of Administration, or i.e. procurement, or, or purchasing, or whatever, has the ability to come back to you and say, we are now going to, we are now going to require that you pay us 1% rebate for doing business with us. Now, is this something that the legislature did? Is this something that the department did by itself? Because it sounds like a, a, a quote. Well, it sounds, like a, it's a, sounds like a rule. It's a kickback. Kick <laughs> yeah, has has anybody it. else seen this? Um, or anybody, I mean, anybody been the uh, federal government just got nailed on that with the, uh, with the, uh, oh. Because they were having those big conferences in Las Vegas. Yeah. That, that money was coming from. Something like that? From a 2% government contract. So, so we already had a contract for the last five years. And then about two years ago, I get this notice from the Department of Administration that says, uh, from now on, you will be required to file a quarterly report on all the sales that you've made under our state contract, which is not only for the state, but it's for school districts, it's for counties, it's for cities, anybody who cares to use the state contract. Right. And you will pay us 1% 
but like the total sales for the privilege, it doesn't, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but for the privilege of doing business with the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. now, for the privilege <coughs> of having the uh, procurement capability. Yeah, but, but see, we had the privilege Did, by going to bid yes, and giving them so good prices right. on our products, right? Did so, they call it an administrative fee? That's what they call it. It's based on right. total sales to the state, to the state contract. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I have a clipboard here for uh, you guys to have email with me for my newsletter. But if you email me some of that information, I can contact the Department of Administration well, and the But I can how that, how that Well, they have they have rule, rules that they can put into place. Uh, within the department because they're under the governor and the governor can allow them to make some rules on how they conduct their business. So and, unless you let us know in the legislature so that we can address it, um, you know, I, it would be good to know that. Yeah, good. It's for the children. It's for the children. I was going to ask you to elaborate on that uh, when you're talking about uh, money because I saw in a paper a few weeks ago, I think Flagstaff Unified is going to put, propose a bond. So if we had that information showing that they actually have money stuck somewhere, yes. we would go before the city council or the school board. Be, or school board, yeah. Yes. Uh, you can actually go to the Arizona State Auditor. He has his own website, and you can select school, school board or a city or a county. And you can look at the audit summary, where there's audit exceptions and problems, and or the entire audit is available, but if you could look at the summary, it'll give you an idea of how much money in the bank, how much they spent, what their expenses, the revenues basically were on their financial statements. Who, who are we go to again? The yeah. Auditor General, yeah. Arizona Auditor General. And they are tasked by the legislature to basically audit everybody. And they have a cycle that they go through for the, the counties and, and school boards and school districts. Uh, they send me the audits from schools and the cities and towns in my district because I asked them to send them to me when they process them. And I have received some from some school districts that they're in trouble. They're in trouble. But you look at where they've been spending your money and you can see why they're in trouble. You know, it's called poor management. You know, they're not putting that money in the classroom. They have more administrators than they do teachers. Yeah. I can tell you that the town of Payson, where I live right now, big article in last week's paper about schools, the school district there, they have more administrators than teachers. And of course they're blaming the legislature. Well, I have a problem with that because we have not done that. We have roll back regulations like you can't believe we have untied their hands. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But we want them to put that money in the classroom. We want the teachers to have a wage increase, not an administrator. Um, have you found out for sure about Ms. Brewer's part 2013 about the sales tax if she's not going to pursue the extension of it? Because I'm in retail business and I get a lot of people saying, you know, our sales tax in Arizona is hot from people from out of state. Well, you could compare it to other states. There are other states that's much higher. Some states don't have it at all. Right. But their property taxes are very high. Mm -hmm. So if you have to pay for the services you want somehow. So we really kind of spread it around a little bit. The sales tax, property tax, and, you know, uh, the different kind of taxes so that we don't suck it to the homeowners all the time. You know, that way you're just renting your land from the government and never paying it off. But the 1%, you think it's going to go away? She's not talking about it. 
She did. She but did. At the she did. opening inauguration of your session this year, I was there and I heard her say it's going away. Yeah. Yes, she did. said that in her speech. She did. Right, in her speech. Yes, in her she. Speech. But she Lots will not be the one that will promote it. No. There are some school districts that are trying to get it on the ballot. I don't know if they'll get the amount of signatures that they need. Um, make sure you vote no. It takes this. Yes. My name is the board of I appreciate the fact I'm the executive. I appreciate the fact that. Uh, you are not only aware that uh, perhaps you seem to be well, ver well versed uh, in the Agenda 21 issue, which, uh, and you know that it affects our borders, our sovereignty, and, and what issues the Western states particularly in our state. Um, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because that begins to be one of my questions where the opposition came from. Uh, I had the comment conspiracy theories, if you will, but I, I, since we have, I forget the deal number that deals with the sovereignty of Arizona. And I don't believe uh, some of the legislatures were actually trying to rely on that to fend off federal or human offenses uh, like this, which I don't believe would be strong enough. But um, you are probably aware of the fact that Utah other states who are the first in the recently who is actually trying to boot the federal government out of uh, their land possessions mm -hmm. and so on. That. And uh, if it would be something that would be a new agenda to jump on it ASAP. Yes, actually we have to speak. And if, if, if I may suggest, uh, if you need any help, I, I understand one of our the issues uh, that is not resolved yet are to establish a state guard. And as such, I would like that uh, the aging is extended to over 60. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> um, let's see, I was going to address your one question about um, Utah. Yes, Representative Ken Ivory and I. Uh, worked very closely with that legislation. He is in Utah and ours in Arizona. I had that bill. It was held in committee. The committee chairman refused to bring it out of committee. A gentleman from Pinal County, Frank Frack, I don't mind telling you, he is a Republican. <coughs> And I talked to him many times about bring the bill out, give it a hearing, let the people hear it. I don't know. Um, it's, uh, but we had a bill like that, and um, it set up that the, uh, the BLM land, the forestry land, uh, would be ceded as it should have been during statehood to the state of Arizona, for the state of Arizona to manage as their own uh, land. That doesn't mean we're gonna sell everything. Uh, we would still have Arizona public lands where we could use them for hunting and camping. And, but it would allow some municipalities to purchase land where they're landlocked. Some cities and towns are landlocked with uh, uh, Forest Service and BLM and all that sort of thing. It would allow them to do some expansion and uh, thereby increase the economic uh, cycle for Arizona. The land that would have been sold was to be split 50-50 with Arizona and the federal government. And the 50% that Arizona would have kept uh, would have been divided up into uh, care of the, of the land itself, self-perpetuate uh, care of the forest and forest management, management of our, our water, our Department of Water Resources to keep them funded because their funding was really uh, down to, all, I think they'll have a couple of people employed there and water is so important to Arizona that uh, we really, really needed to make sure we could have a funding stream a revenue stream to keep them, them going. Because right now, 
the federal government is trying to nationalize the water. We can't let them do that. That's why this tombstone thing is so important. Uh, it is really important. Um, so, uh, you know what? I had that bill. I had that bill for Arizona, and I'm going to do it again. And uh, I've asked the Speaker of the House to make sure that I am the Chairman of Energy and Natural Resources. <laughs> Excuse me? Tell them that the state blood is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yes. Isn't the nationalization movement of the water part of Obama's executive order to regulate all coastal waters and all the inland waterways? Wasn't it, it like trying to zone it? To cover that you can fish and you can't fish? Yes. yes. And he's using the uh, Department of Interior yes. for yes. service to the and, and, and all of those agencies. Through policy, executive order, exec not ex legislative order. Exactly, executive, executive order. order. The executives have way too much power. These executive orders, whether it's in the state of Arizona, can tell you that our governor has the power, mm -hmm. and she can do things the legislature does not want her to do. But we are powerless to stop her at this time. Yes. Well, in the sense of like what's happening in Yuma and stuff, you have have state sovereignty issues and like the governor, I mean I've heard some people I've uh, read using the National Guard to enforce uh, you know their ability to rebuild whatever they need to do down there. I mean you you're it's a matter when will we go nose to nose with the federal government and just say, okay enough enough is enough. Yeah. Well, we are in a way with the 1070. Yeah. Okay. I I think that the Supremes are going to uphold it myself. I really believe yeah. they're going to uphold it because it's mirrored image of the federal <coughs> law to begin with. Yeah. It it just puts in the state of Arizona where it says federal government. And if you listen to any of the uh, audio when they were having the hearings, you you know you can tell that the judges had some rather poignant questions. And uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what they're thinking and how they're thinking about this. So I, I think 1070 um, is, is a good starting point. But we need to continue that with our natural resources, with the statehood that we have here in the West. I can tell you that Representative Ken Ivory and I also are working with people in Colorado, Montana, the, really, the, the Rocky Mountain states. California is not interested. Oregon and Washington, not interested. Although there are some folks on the western side of Oregon and Washington that are interested, but if you can't get their legislature to back them up, it, it won't happen. So it's a it it's something that we really want to do, and uh, there's a lot of us that have the grit to stand up and and do it. But there are those ten that we have to look out for. I, I just want to say, well, thank you for standing up because I'm part of the rapid response team. Oh, okay? yes. And some people are nice. here and some people who are aren't here. But it's very frustrating. We have the House, the Senate, mm -hmm. and the Governor. And I told him in the Tobin's office this, don't ask for my vote if you're not going to do the people's work. So that was frustrating on the part of the rapid response. We kept calling. We yep. kept after them. Yep. And like you say, it wouldn't even come out of the Right. Right. Exactly. Thank you for being there. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. We live in a small city, about 60,000, 50, about 15,000 university. So they are not uh, a citizen of this uh, city. We have district school, huge one in the city, where they make up programs in mathematics, in foreign languages, and it's in some other areas. Two areas which I know is foreign languages with PhDs in mathematics. I came from a country where they had one program for whole country and one textbook for whole country. And this program was twice as more intensive than in America. My daughter finished fourth grade. She came to school six months. She came in America and was ahead in sixth, seventh grade. So why would I would like to tell? Another thing, we have another district. 
a couple miles from uh, miles from us. It's parks. It's very close to our city. So we have huge districts. It's made up from soap programs. And this is money. Can we change that? Well, remember I said that school districts have autonomy in Arizona. Arizona does not design all the curriculum and purchase all the books. Texas does. State of Texas, they purchase all the books and the curriculum, and that's what you teach. Arizona allows the school districts that autonomy for, for books and curriculum, although they still have to pass the test. We have the AIMS test, and then they have a certain uh, test that they have to take for promotion. Thank you so much. Please remember to sign my petition back there. And uh, I also have uh, on a small clipboard where you can sign up with your email address. I can send out um, newsletters and things, and then you can contact me through that as well. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, I just want to grab you before any of you get out of here. There's two sets of petitions back there, one for Bob, one for Brenda. They need these things signed for the next two weeks. So I, I want to encourage you, please sign them for both of them. Did anybody have any requests for Peggy for the bumper stickers? She's leaving. Yeah, I got to get bumper stickers. Get your bumper stickers. So uh, Brenda, can they sign petitions for her? Two petitions, so you can sign two petitions. Uh, guys, I want to thank you, Brenda, thank and you. thank you, Bob.